The Brutal Extreme Triathlon is known as one of the toughest triathlons on the planet. So yes, bartender, I will make it a double. The scale of this race is quite difficult to comprehend, but in real terms, it's a 7.6 kilometer swim, a 373 kilometer bike ride with 6,000 meters of elevation gain, and an 84.4 kilometer run with 2,100 meters of elevation gain, inclusive of Mount Snowdon, which is the tallest mountain in Wales. So it's a big couple of days out, that's for sure. Whilst I've made the scale of the race in numbers quite clear, what this actually meant for me, the person going through it, was really quite difficult to comprehend. And Reality only really started to set in the day before when I was aware of how long I was going to be chipping away at this thing. Getting my stuff ready in the morning, all of the self-doubts and worries that I'd had leading up to race day started to creep back in and I started asking questions around whether my foot was going to hold up as I'd had a bit of a niggle, a bit of an injury there, which meant I couldn't run for the past three, four weeks. Whether I could get through a bike ride that long, whether I was going to really struggled with the fatigue, the sleep deprivation, all these things that had really been scaring me started to really come front of mind. And I just asked myself the question, had I done enough? And at this point, I didn't know. I don't know At the swim start, the race nerves were there, but it was in a different way to normal because the time pressure was taken off. And actually the feeling was one of real fear at what I was about to experience and the sheer scale of it. So final race briefing done. And we're heading into start pens basically. So I think all the greens are gonna kick off first because we're gonna be in there for a, a little while longer. But this is just about taking your time. I'm kind of nervous, but in a strangely, patient sense in that I know that I can get through this I know that I can get through a big chunk of the bike it's going to be hours if not days from now when things really really start to tank so stick to the plan and as I always say see what happens and let's crack on and nonetheless and any other cliche that I normally say in these videos that you could probably use as a drinking game So that internal pressure to perform, that's ultimately why I do these things, it started to manifest itself in a really uncomfortable way, as if I started to talk myself out of my ability to even just get through this portion of the day, which was the swim. Mass swim starts are always challenging, but this one was a bit different because I knew that if I just sat back and let everybody else crack on, then I'd be in a much more comfortable position. I promised myself I wouldn't look at my watch for the first two laps so that I could just get into a steady rhythm, get the mass start out of the way and just get comfortable in what was going to be a long swim. So the format for the swim was four rounds of two laps and each set of two laps equated to a half iron distance triathlon, so 1900 meters. And not only did it give a great opportunity to get some food on board, get some fluids on board, but it gave you that psychological break point to engage with your support crew, just get some time on land and reset before you went in for the next set of two. Practically speaking, we found from the training process just how important it was to get food and hydration on board as soon as possible. So from swimming in locks around Scotland, 
we learned what was going to work best so really made sure to have a strict strategy in place for when I was out of the water and what actually happened was as the pack started to break up as I got that psychological break in and out of the water seeing my friends seeing my family and having that opportunity to reset I really enjoyed this swim it was the first time in a long time where the pressure to perform within time metrics was taken away because ultimately all I had to do was get the swim out of the way. Yes, there was a time I was shooting for and I came in exactly around where I was hoping to, but I just got to enjoy swimming in a beautiful setting at a rhythmic pace without looking at my watch. And ultimately that made me really, really enjoy it. Physically, I felt my stroke and a bit of stiffness start to appear in my muscles with about 200 meters to go. So all in all, quite well timed. And whilst I was happy to get out of the water, I didn't feel in any way like I'd been beaten up by the process. It was a very different experience, not worrying about timing too much, just sort of enjoying the process of moving, it's sort of. Reminds me of why I started training like this in the first place, I guess, because I enjoyed doing the discipline. So it was quite peaceful in the end. The sun came out, beautiful morning, and there's no rush now. I mean, I'd like to finish as soon as possible in the grand scheme of things, obviously, but it's not like I'm making a cut off that I'm worried about or anything. It's just keep moving, getting going, being comfortable, getting things right, rather than uh, bursting myself to try and move too quickly. <sighs> Ultimately, transition one felt very much the same as the swim, where I could just get into a rhythm, take my time and enjoy the process. The time pressures and the metrics being taken away allowed me to just get my head down and make sure that we had everything I needed, rather than worrying about the time I'd set that I wanted to be in and out of T1 in, the cutoffs looming in the future, or the metrics that I'd said I want to be moving at the pace of. So we got everything we needed done, no mistakes made, out onto the bike. Enjoy, buddy. See you soon, mate. So the bike is in a similar format to the swim. Eight laps around Snowdonia with some pretty aggressive elevation to contend with. And the first set of hills out of Clamberis are pretty punchy. And I was feeling pretty good. That was until 44 minutes had passed and my fancy technical, rather expensive, electrical gearing decided to exit the building stage left. On the bike marshals for the event, um, your rider, his gear, his gear selectors are broke. He says he needs his spare bike, um, and he needs a cable off the dining room table. No. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, it does. We've got the spare bike, we're on the way to him. Um, he can use that in okay. the interim. Listen, mate, we're on on our way. We've we've kind of picked up from another competitor as well. And uh, if you see him, tell him we're coming. Yeah, no, no. I've, I've had to go a uh, good few miles away from him to uh, get a posting. That's all. Oh, thanks so much, mate. Very much appreciate that. Okay, cheers. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Cheers for now. Bye. Cheers. Bye, bye, mate. So there's no camera crew and there's no support car, so you just have me on my phone. So for context, these are my gears and these are my gears. And they control this and this, which allows me to change gears and therefore move efficiently. However, they're electric and they have failed. So this monitor here tells me about the battery and whether everything's working. Battery's fully charged, I made very sure of that but the upshift and downshift is just showing red. So I don't know what's gone wrong, but it's just failed. I've been here for about 45 minutes now. I've had a lot of people offering to help. Um, a lot of people didn't know anything about the gears or any more than I did anyway, which is enough to sort of get by, but not when things go this wrong. And then had two cars there from Bolton, lovely folk that just did their best to help with the information they had. But seems that even a system override with the tapping combination isn't enough. So I'm here waiting for Johnny the support car to bring my other bike because I've given my phone number to some people that have gone up ahead to get signal as I have no phone signal and ultimately I'm just trying to remain calm I'm trying to realize that there's nothing that I can do here and 
I've just got to waste it out. This is a fantastic example of how emotional control can play such a big part in events like these. Ultimately, had I done what we as humans tend to do and catastrophize and think, oh, my whole race has fallen apart, I've lost an hour and a half here, how am I going to be able to pick this up and get back to where I want to be? I just approach things neutrally. It's a strategy I've learned over the years to just look at things objectively, neutrally, and make a plan to move forwards. The DI2 is a complex thing. Nobody knows what's going on now. Right, I've got all these. I've got everything I need. Bottom line is, that's an hour lost. Don't worry about it. That's an hour lost, which is which is not the end of the world. It just means less sleep, if any. Yeah. But I'm doing a double, so I've got plenty of time. Yeah. I've just spent the whole time here emotionally controlling myself. Could have easily just cursed the skies, but completely out with, completely out with my control. Don't worry. <laughs> But like it is, it is what it is, and it wouldn't happen, be extreme if shit didn't go wrong, would if it? If it's going to happen, happen though, we've got the delay where you where you're not tanked and all the rest of it. I feel I feel absolutely fine as well. So it's, it's just a, it's just a case of it's just a frustration that I was sitting here knowing I'm losing lights. That's the only thing that's been annoying me. Crack on, mate. Try and enjoy it. It's beautiful, it's stunning right here. I know this part very well, and I'll see it again seven times. Yeah. <laughs> right, going it. Right. See you soon. I was stuck without signal, without gears for a long period of time, but I had plenty of time left. This is a double Ironman distance extreme triathlon. There was lots of time still to play with. Yes, it meant I was probably gonna be a bit slower than I'd hoped. Yes, it meant that I'd had a real internal wrestle with myself, but ultimately I'd won. So be proud of that, head down, get in that aero position and crack on. Bike's fixed. Is it? Yeah. What was wrong? Cable came out. Yeah, the bike's fixed. Okay, that's what's your nutrition like though? I'm fine. I'm, fi I'm fine, but I need to get a little bit in me just because I don't have it. It's how much harder to access. Could have been worse. Just means less sleep or more running. Mm, no, running distance is the same. I do need food. I'm talking shite. <laughs> definitely feel the lack of uphill power that comes from being on a dry bike so it's going to be tough on the penny pass quick pit stop as this hill is brutal and I'm just trying to sort of split things up a little bit sensibly with so long to go. Warm, which is rinsing through fluids. I feel okay, I feel tired now. And I keep forgetting when I look at the kilometers on the screen that there was the swim before that and a stupidly early morning. So it's difficult not to apply expectations or what's normal to it. So the uh, ramifications of one hour lost of daylight is gonna catch up with me later on. It's very lonely out here. Obviously the full have finished, the half have finished, and then there's not that many people doing the double. So, yeah, is what it is. There's honestly not much to report from laps two, three, and most of four, because I just got my head down and settled into what was a familiar distance, let my emotions settle, and try to conserve as much mental and physical energy for where this was gonna get really tough. And that was until the tail end of lap four when... So I need to laugh at myself here really because everything I've just said about neutral thinking and emotional control somewhat went out of the window when this happened because I just could not believe that two separate components on two separate bikes from two separate companies had gone in one race. It's unheard of. I've never heard of anything like that happening before and I couldn't believe it was happening to me on this important day. Andy, the bike mechanic at Race HQ, thank you very much. He was an absolute lifesaver and managed to bring both bikes back from the relative dead. And whilst I did have a little bit of an emotional outpouring, some language was aggressively shared that potentially shouldn't have been just at the world and the universe in general. Both bikes have failed, both gears. Yeah. This one's fixed, but the road bike's not working. Oh, you why has that happened at the same? It sounds made up. I know, I know. Get your head down, crack on. Know that in the background, we've got a, a proper mechanic on it, and we'll manage and, and think about how to process the rest of it. All you need to do is keep the energy and keep yourself moving and keep your head in this particular game. If you, if you start 
spiral out, then, then you're going to struggle more. So bring yeah. yourself into the moment. Laps are fine when there's people and yeah. other competitors, and like, oh, I'm just getting dropped by cars. And yeah. There's, 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 I, yeah, I feel pretty lonely well, listen, out there. There's no, there's no talk around in that either, mate, because it's going to get dark. It's going to yeah, get yeah no, no, so no, 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 I think no. What, what you and I will do on the next few things is just talk about how we're going to strategize again, make sure that we know we're kind of together on it a little bit. Um, you've got, you've got a couple of hours to kind of rotate that thought in your head, and maybe bring yourself back to the. I ultimately calmed down, was thankful to still have a bike that was working at that point, and I set off for lap number five. I actually felt really positive setting off for lap five because I knew that every kilometre now was getting me closer to the end. I'd broken the back of it and what a feeling that was. But about halfway into this lap, I really started to actually realise that I had to do everything I'd done up until this point again. And I did have a bit of an inner dialogue where I started to let self-doubt creep in. I knew the darkness was coming. My pace had dropped off a bit because of all the stuff that had been going on with mechanicals. And I started to let that human tendency to catastrophize take over a little bit. I had a bit of a wrestle with myself for the rest of the lap. Then we got the lights on the bike just before the last climb of the Penny Pass and descended into Clamberis to round off five laps as darkness fell. Just, just two or three problems this time, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it working? Yeah, everything's, everything's good. Feeling quite solid, actually. Definitely time to make the change. Just about to head off, but before I do, I'm going to get a black coffee down me because I've got to the point where I've kind of got that sweet furriness in my mouth and the bitterness of a black coffee will wash it away and we're back to square one to do it all over again. <laughs> oh, this is very silly, all this really, isn't it? But Very refreshing. Into the darkness we go. Quiet roads and the same old scenery, just with less visibility. And the first lap was actually quite novel because you don't often get the opportunity to ride in this bubble of light, knowing that these big mountains behind you, knowing that the roads are quiet, knowing that everybody else is falling asleep, going to bed, having their dinner, and you're out still doing this thing. So it was a bit surreal and a bit funny. And then the novelty wore off. Upper body is starting to hurt, swims catching up with me. Just keep going, I guess. It's not as bad in the dark as I thought it'd be. And it's different, which means it's, for the time being, somewhat fascinating, which means it was somewhat bearable, but I'm sure that will change. Nonetheless, I'm struggling to get food down me. I'm starting to feel a bit sick. And the things I tried to eat up there, I really, really struggled to stomach. And yeah, need to try and find a solution to that. Otherwise, things will fall apart quite quickly. Given that I was so fatigued, given that there was so much left to go, and then a run on top of that, again, I got into that negative headspace where I just started to think, how am I gonna do this? You can't do this, Fergus. And it was just one pedal stroke after the next. And then problem number three arose, which was my light deciding to exit the building stage right. Maybe it won't go on where you're charging it. It might, but it just needs, it, I think it did last night actually, but it just needs to keep going through first. Yeah, I'll need a, it'll be like an iPhone or something. At this point we had to improvise and had to make use of the support truck as my illumination from behind me. So whilst there were a fair few sections that were illuminated from streetlights, for the most part I was lit up by the truck. started to feel my first real hit of tiredness and I knew it was coming but then all of a sudden just like that I was nodding off a little bit on the bike I started swaying left to right and I kind of didn't really acknowledge what was happening and then the support car behind me saw oh he's fallen asleep on the bike and pulled me in just for a little bit of food a little bit of chit chat and a big hit of caffeine to try and get me through the rest of the night I started getting tired started getting a little bit nod off like not phrase but you know what I mean on that downhill there so just gonna get some more food on board before the big climb just struggling to get food on on the bike because everything I can carry is not sitting well. So I'm going to get some actual food on. That's spot on. 
mushroom pasta, that is spot on. That's gonna sit really well. I'm gonna get a seat and then we'll just get cracking again. But moving well, it's just, it's just a slog now. It's just a real slog. To add to the series of unfortunate events that we've experienced today, the light that I bought um, recently that advertises six to eight hours of battery life at low power gave me two hours and 25 minutes on low power. Classic case of you can plan and plan and plan and plan for things like this, but things will go wrong. So it's, it's how you sort of move through them that matters. And I actually feel immediately better having this down me. So I'm gonna take a seat. Oh. Can you turn the full beam off? <laughs> Please. Once I was back on the bike, having brought myself back from that tiredness a little bit, I did start to really feel the concern bubbling up within me around if I was tired now, how on earth was I gonna get through the rest of this? At this point as well, I was struggling to get food down me. My palate was pretty worn out. I was struggling to get fluids down that didn't make me feel sick. And I was just in this sort of circle of concern that was then developing and the fatigue was going up. I was in the dark. I was spending a lot of time on my own. And all of these negative thoughts really started to spiral. Something I experienced at this point that I hadn't properly accounted for was loneliness. The roads were quiet. I was on my own, it was dark. I didn't even have things to look at or people or cars to engage with. And these two, two and a half hour laps really started to feel quite lonely, demanding, and that bubble of light that I was in just really started to wear me down. In simple terms, we got through lap seven and had a little bit of chit chat with other people out doing the double. A few of them had support bike riders with them, which was potentially an oversight on my part, but got through it into lap eight. So definitely degraded there so i left here at 2 15 and silently promised myself i was going to get back here by 4 30. got here at 4 30 on the nose so big success there but that last little section oh, was just so disheartening because it's the worst section where you get that really class descent and then you're just rolling and you got a really drop down power to keep moving right to here so it's kind of like a oh we're descending in oh no you gotta work a bit harder but then knowing that I've got to do that one more time is just quite upsetting, to be honest. Um, and I spent the whole descent feeling like I was going to throw up, as if I'd like been spun around like I was dizzy. I haven't been getting food on on the bike, just haven't been managing. Nothing I've got on me I can stomach. Chews, gels, they're all off the table, just can't stomach them. Every sip of water makes me feel like I'm going to throw up for the next minute or so. So I'm hoping this goes down okay, and then I can get some water to wash it down. But really, we're not expecting it to be smooth sailing at this point, but if I can't keep getting food on, then the run's gonna be an absolute nightmare. So I've got to think that I'm eating for the run now on the bike, when if I just had one lap to go, I could probably just accept I'll bonk and see it through. <laughs> but let's see, let's see. Yeah, don't you? Heading out for lap eight, I had that moment of joy that I had on lap seven, where I was like, oh, we're almost there, we're almost there. And then I was hit again with that Oh, that could be another three hours at this rate and it's lonely I'm worn out and I'm just I'm just worn thin at this point oh, this stupid hill again I don't even know what I want to eat. This is so frustrating, I can't get enough in me, and if I can't fuel now, how am I gonna keep fueling for the run to come? I hope they don't see me struggling here because then they might pull me in and that's gonna just put me further behind on time. So during lap seven and for most of lap eight, what I really started to struggle with were hallucinations. And it wasn't a case of seeing things that weren't there, but it was reframing shapes that I could see as other things. So it'd be a tree and a wall and I'd almost see it as a, as a crocodile leaning over a wall and I'd kind of look at it and blink a bit and be like, I know it's not a crocodile, but what actually is it? And then I'd slowly be able to break down as my vision changed and, and things like that, what it actually was. So it wasn't in any way scary or intimidating. It was just fascinating that that was the point that I got to. And what was less fascinating was when that tiredness actually almost became dangerous. As 55 kilometers downhill, one of the big descents on the course, I nodded off briefly, going downhill, just veered to the left a little bit and woke myself up. And 
knew at that moment that there was no way I was going to get through this without a little bit of sleep. So pulled in on lap eight for my only 15 minutes of sleep of the weekend, ultimately. And whilst it was frustrating that I just wanted to get my head down and see it through to the finish of the bike, I needed that 15 minutes of sleep. I didn't want to risk coming down the descent of the Penny Pass and having the same thing happen. Getting to the finish line was priority number one. Getting there in whatever time didn't matter to me anymore. I'd lost a lot of the uncontrollables through the mechanicals, so it meant that I just wanted to get my head down and get done. And the best way to do that was to get 15 minutes of sleep. I wish I could tell you that we timed this to perfection and this was all intentional and that we tricked my circadian rhythm, but I went to sleep with the darkness really just coming to a close and the light just trickling through. And as I opened my eyes, 15 to 20 minutes later, there was light. So psychologically, that gave me such a boost. And I think biologically as well, that'll have given my body a bit of a, bit of a cue that it was morning as I was opening my eyes. So therefore, how restorative that 15 to 20 minutes of sleep was, I don't know in terms of quantifiable data, but I tell you what, I felt a lot better for it. At this point onwards, I knew the work was done on the bike. I got to really enjoy a beautiful, one of the most beautiful mornings I've ever experienced in my life. And all of the fatigue, all of the concern, all of the worry about this event was just momentarily washed away because I just got to embrace and enjoy the surroundings I was in. So I saw it through to the finish on the bike and was actually very grateful to have that as a finish. Came in just over 24 hours total elapsed time down. The bike was done, it was a battle. I had to fight hard and ultimately seeing 373 kilometers on my bike computer in front of me when I know 150, 160, 170 kilometers, I had no idea of how I was gonna get there, made me feel very proud. Um, ruined, actually, to be honest. <laughs> Not quite sure how I'm gonna get anything done, let alone a mountain. And an ultra on top of that but if this trust can justifiably become prime minister then we can make it happen <laughs> cheers boss god that was dreadful truly dreadful there's nothing about that i would recommend to anyone I'm kidding tomorrow i'll sign up to the triple <laughs> so plan a had been actually getting a few hours of sleep in transition two before we headed up Snowdon, but given that the mechanicals had eaten into our wiggle room time and I'd had that really quite useful sleep earlier on lap eight, I thought, let's just crack on. So Johnny in the support car, who was coming up with the Snowdon as a mandatory support runner, he got 15 minutes of sleep and I just got some food in me, got some hydration in me, but made very sure not to sit down or lie down, as I can only imagine that if I had done, it would have looked something like that. This is going to be tough. I'm battered, to be honest. I can dress this up and pretend, ooh, rah, let's go, but I'm a bit concerned. It's just going to hurt. The first section of stone is so steep and I just know it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt my confidence. It's going to make me wonder whether, whether I've got it in me, but I'm with Johnny. I've got other people on the mountain to stare at, interact with, which will pass the time. It's a beautiful day. And whilst I do feel like I've been hit by a bus. And then the bus driver decided that he wanted to finish the job off and reversed over my face. And then decided to get out and repeatedly punch me in my traps and then make me ride 360 kilometers. Yeah, I'm apprehensive about this, but at the end of the day, it's just the distance I need to cover. I've covered distances before, one foot in front of the other. I've put one pedal stroke in front of the other today and there were points along the way where I wasn't sure if I had it in me. But that was a, that, that a soul-searchingly tough experience. I've had an amazing time upon very quick reflection with the support team. Everybody's been an absolute hero. Very, very grateful to them all. And whilst I do feel rough, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to trying to find my run legs and see, see where we end up. So again, a very relaxed, very non-stressful transition before we headed up into what looked like a beautiful morning up onto Snowdon. Visibility was good for the most part. It was actually almost, dare I say, 
too hot, but I hadn't accounted for that in terms of my packing. So whilst I was covered on water and hydration and everything, it did just mean I felt a little bit higher effort than I had expected to. But honestly, going into Snowden, I felt great. The first section is quite steep and I got through that and then it was just really steady, one foot in front of the other, get to the summit. And my legs feel workable. I just feel heavy and sluggish, but there's no like twinge or pain or real unmanageable fatigue in my legs, which means I'm confident I can make something work. Yeah. But my lung, my lungs, I can feel fatigue in my lungs as if I've... You're breathing hard for yeah. 28 hours. Yeah, 28 hours, yeah. So, so it, it's just, my, my breathing's laboured, so it, the effort level isn't reflected by the breathing, but... I think for you as well, you yeah. know, there's some time needed to just open out after yeah. you've been in the bike for so long, so we'll crack on with this, mate, and uh, come down at a good steady canter, and then get you on the next one. That's it. I had some fantastic chat with Johnny. I really got to experience being in a state of fatigue and having those emotional, honest conversations. And it really made me thankful for the support team around me, the people in my life that have helped me get to the start line, that have helped me get through the race to that point, and the people that were gonna help me get there. And that's ultimately what races like these are all about. They're about community, they're about support, they're about honesty, they're about problem solving, and they're about the process of getting that person to the start line, which isn't just down to that person alone. Three quarters of the way up Snowden and we're getting to the sort of scree steep bit. Yeah. Very well described, I know. Yeah, you're right though. But you're right. The, the terrain's changing a little bit, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. starting to just be that little bit harder again. But realistically, once we're past the sort of four-fifths mark, it's a real easy walk in. Yeah. It, it, it's for anyone that's not been up here, it's a beautiful, beautiful part of the world and Snowden's a very easily accessible and manageable mountain for people wanting to get into things like this. I think that's our Uber. Oh, yeah. Sorry, got to go. Anybody around us, the crew and all the rest of it will see it. Is, my mood's gone through the roof, I feel elated. And it's it's what we've talked about all the time, isn't it? It's, it's the fact that you and I are back on a hill together. I'll get emotional if I'm not quick about it. You and I are back on a hill together, marching up, enjoying conversations about the mad experience you've just had, enjoying some deep conversations about the darkness that you literally marched through, and just realising, I know you were about to do a bit to camera there, about the beauty of this place, but enjoying that together. You can see I'm in, in mad high spirits, and I'm grateful for it, mate, and I'm, I'm proud of you. You did an amazing job. We're right at the top. It's not over yet. Another peak. No, another you. peak together, though, and then we're going to crack on again. So. Yeah, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to get through the first two stages without the broader support mechanisms, which I think is a translatable message. Yeah. And that's why spending some time at the summit of Snowdon with people close to me, having barely slept on a Sunday morning, having covered a 7.6k swim, a 373k bike, and then making it to the top of Snowdon, I thought, this is surreal. This really is surreal. Top of Snowdon, so swim done, bike done, snow done. <sighs> nice, it's 77k to go, which wipes the smile clean off my face. So 7.6k back down the way we've come, and then 70k remaining across eight laps. So 5.2 mile or eight and a half, give or take K laps around there. So it's a good way to chunk it out and sort of break it down. But it's still a very long way. So <laughs> swings and roundabouts. But honestly, I'm, I'm surprised at how elated, cognitive, and just generally high spirits I feel and I think it's all down to the, the sort of community we've got around this the, the support team the the effort that's gone into this seeing it come together and getting the opportunity to do it in a great setting with a, a good day's weather and knowing that there are a lot of scraps on that bike that I've come out victorious on so I actually managed to descend Snowden at some pace because I felt great honestly my legs were confusingly well prepared for this strange Sunday morning but after a really confident, really enjoyable descent, in fact, we got to that steep bit of tarmac where my quads just took a battering. And after false confidence coming down Snowden, as I arrived in T2, my legs felt like they had done a lot more work than they had done than when I set off. Snowden, complete, had some food, like some proper food, bacon roll, egg, ketchup, and added some salt so I can catch up on electrolytes a little bit. Chin some fluids. I'm going to head off for lap one of eight of the lake. And in other news, this has decided to pack in. Three from three on tech failures. You actually could not make this up. 
Mm. So I'm going to have to do 70 kilometers blind. Mm. See you soon. Right, see you soon, bud. Whether it was lack of sleep, deliriousness, or just a total lack of confidence in myself at this stage, I just found it really funny that at this point I still had 70 kilometers to run. Yeah. Moving well, I've got a clear strategy for it. It's gonna to be tough, but it's all doable within the cutoff. But as long as I'm coming in under 90 minutes a lap, then I'm within the parameters I need to be within. So in theory, we're all good. Um, just need to crack on and I think minimize rest time here. Running an ultra after an ultra swim and an ultra bike is difficult. Who could have seen that coming? It's hot as well, which is something that's getting me. My hair is going to be atrocious, I can guarantee, but there is rain forecast at 3 p.m. So hopefully that cools me down. But as they say, keep on keeping on. Similar brief to as with the swim and the bike, use lap one to just settle into the surroundings knowing that there are lots more laps to follow. So I knew that I was gonna need a really strict, clear strategy on each lap that I could replicate as time went on so that I could break up what was a pretty daunting 70K remaining. I wanted to be light, I wanted to be agile, so I didn't take a trail bag with me and just relied on the aid station up about 4.85K along the eight kilometer course. What that strategy became was bang on four kilometers of running from T2 to the bottom of what I'm only gonna call the hill from hell, as it was 1.61 kilometers, better known as a mile, like that, tarmac. So no variation in terrain, you had to walk it. I don't know of anyone doing the double that ran any of it. There was no choice. So steep, you just had to walk. But at the top of that hill lay the aid station, so it was quite neatly timed. So it basically worked out as four kilometers of running, walking rest up to a bit of a refuel, and then you were down into the woods, down into the trails, where there was a bit more focus, a bit more variation in footing, a few downhills that really hurt the quads, and a few uphills that equally really hurt the quads, but also meant that you didn't get into a steady downhill, let's see it in sort of rhythm. And then once you got to a certain point, you knew you were basically there. So psychologically, you had 1K, one, one and a bit K to get in. Then you could refuel, have a bit of crack with those around you, and off you went again. I need to get back on. Okay. Five minutes Fluids and electrolytes. That's that one. Wait, what food do you want? Oh. Let's try some crisps. Flavor? Uh, it's not vinegar. First two laps, 104, that lap was 110. So basically, if we can just keep chipping away at that pace, not take the pace sitting around here, we're fine. But the wheels could fall off. There's nothing, there's no pain. Nothing's like screaming at me, which is good. Well, my entire body. I, the right trap is from the swim, but run wise, it's not like my Achilles is flared up or anything like that. It's just, just wear and tear from what's been a big weekend. So the whole way through, I did manage to run every segment of that 4K. There were a few bits where I was just eating as I left T2 and then set off, but that was a really good way of breaking it down psychologically and physically. This is where things got tough. The hallucinations became challenging and I actually jumped at a few things that weren't there. I was seeing leaves as squirrels and birds and felt like I was getting bitten by a dog at one point. I saw Dick Dastardly out of a couple of trees and I was looking at it and trying to break it down and being like, what is that? And I just kept seeing dick dastardly i was like i know it isn't oh okay it's a branch and then there's some bushes and yeah okay but it was just really quite weird and it put me quite on edge but it did keep me quite alert which i guess is a good byproduct here but ultimately as we were getting back into the darkness that's where my morale really really dropped i really start i really started to hate that hill like really started to hate it i was dreading it every time i got there it was sapping my legs and when I got to the top, I was just having my confidence drained lap by lap. And even when I got to lap six, lap seven, I didn't feel like the work was done. I still couldn't see a way to the finish, even though I'd obviously come so far. My confidence was worn so thin. My morale was so thin. My physicality was so thin. I was so worn out. I couldn't see how I was going to get to the finish line. And my inner voice became really quite aggressive. I started to really worry about how I was actually going to get it done. And then for the last couple of laps, the rain became biblical. I was in the marquee for a little bit before I head out for lap six, and it started tanking it down with rain. And as I heard the rain come down, I thought, oh, 
best wait that out. But I couldn't wait it out, I had to keep moving. So having the choice taken away from me in some ways was good because I was so tired at that point, I wanted to stay out of the rain and be a bit more comfortable. But getting out into the rain, it was actually so humid and so hot that being in a waterproof, for the most part, was actually too warm. There were the last two laps, the temperature really had dropped, so I was in a waterproof for that. But it was just difficult to dress for, it was difficult to prepare for, it was difficult to, to have faith in myself to get to the end. But that was the tiredness talking, because obviously I was gonna see it through, but it was really tough. It was really tough. And the hallucinations that I remember, some of them made me scared and feel alone and feel almost childlike. Some of them just really confused me. Some of them I was looking at the things that I'd been seeing and what they actually were and I had no idea how my brain had made some sort of connection. But ultimately I came in and head out for my last lap and that's when the confidence had set in that I just had to get through this. And I actually finished my last lap in one of the fastest times out of the eight laps of the day. Honestly, coming down that last, that last section, knowing that the work was done, Johnny next to me, the pride that I felt in the process, the fact that I managed to get to the start line for one, the fact that I managed to hold out through the uncontrollables for two, the fact that every bit of self-doubt, every drop in confidence, every drop in morale, every challenge that was thrown my way, I managed to fight through and win for three. And then the fact I managed to see it through to the finish line was just incredible to me. I just had so much pride in myself and the team around me and so much faith in what can be done by taking the first step towards something. No, no stage of this has been easy in terms of the prep or the process itself, but for me, I know now that I'm a better person having gone through this. The reason I take on things like this is because I know there is a better Fergus that lies on the other side, so let's go and find him. Johnny often talks about meeting yourself along the way and you need to meet yourself, you need to shake hands with yourself and you need to have a conversation about how you're gonna move forwards. And I had that so many times along the way. And every time I came out victorious, I won. I kept taking those steps forwards. I didn't get knocked down. I managed to keep my emotions under control for the most part. And next time I'm thrown something that really knocks me back, I will be better prepared. And that is ultimately why I think endurance training can change lives, why events like this one exist ultimately, because there are people out there that want to explore themselves, physically, psychologically, and just go through an experience that is unlike any other. I don't think this will have done the experience justice as much as we will have tried to do so, Lived experience is all that can develop your resilience in such a way. I know how far I've come in a short space of time in the grand scheme of things from just taking one step towards these things. And now years down the line, a version of me five years ago looking at myself now would have no comprehension of the progress, the self-development, and the things that I've gained at a personal level from things like this. And I'm not saying you need to go out and do a double Ironman distance extreme triathlon, I'm just saying maybe you need to take the first step towards something that scares you, something that you've been thinking on for a while, something that you think might make you a better version of yourself because there is so much reward to be had. And I can only thank the support team around me. My overriding thought throughout the fatigue, the tiredness, was how grateful I am to have the people in my life that are important to me. It was a really good way of calibrating on myself, on the things that matter, and on what I'm gonna do next, and how I view myself. So reflecting on all those things now is, is difficult to process because there's so much there, but the reward this has given me, the process, the journey of the event, and everything that's followed will be with me forever. And that's something that I'm very proud to have done. I'm also very thankful to Brutal Events for putting on such a challenging, challenging mechanism for this self-exploration. But a huge thank you to them, a huge thank you to everybody involved, and a huge thank you to everybody that made the event what it was. Community is a big part of this event, whether that's your support crew, whether it's the local community allowing this event to take place, whether it's the race directors, whether it's the volunteers, whether it's the people supporting the athletes. It's it's about supporting one another and propping each other up to get you through the hard times. And I think that is a fantastic metaphor for life. We're in a pretty chaotic part of our human existence right now. And if there is a metaphor that I want to really strike home with this is that we can prop each other up through difficult things. 
and the only way that we can get through things is through the support and care of others around us. Fittingly, the event started on Suicide Prevention Day, September the 10th, and I was reflecting on that a lot as I swam, cycled and ran around Snowdonia and the, over, the overarching thing that came to me was my motivation for these things. And ultimately it's fear. It's fear that I could become the person that I was in 2016 when I decided that the only option for me was suicide. And I'm very, very fortunate to have come out the other side of that and now been able to explore and experience such an amazing event and such an amazing collective effort. But I, I'm fearful of ever feeling that way again. And I know for me the value in these events will keep me so far away from that person because it constantly forces myself to be honest with me, honest with those around me, and really assess what's important to me. Because I think the distraction and the white noise of the modern world is what really makes it difficult for us to do that on a regular basis. So the community impact for the people that stopped and offered me help during their own race when my gears had failed, the people that stopped in their cars to try and make phone calls, to get stuff out of their car to help, that did everything they could. I am just very, very grateful to have experienced what was a real lesson in suffering, a real self-exploration and a real fantastic display of what happens when we come together. So with that in mind, I just want to say thank you to everybody for watching. Thank you to everybody that's been there as part of this process. Thank you to all of you that were a part of the race, that helped, that offered to ask how I was getting on at the side of the road, that said hello, that put on the race, that volunteered, whatever it was, everybody played a part in this. And through the lens of my own experience, I hope this has brought to life what was ultimately a, a fantastic weekend. It was challenging, it was emotional, it was demanding, but it's something that'll be with me forever.